So Sunrise um, is a movement of young people to stop climate change and create millions of good jobs in the process. And Sunrise was born from a group of about a dozen young people who had been working together on, on various issues, pipeline fights or fossil fuel divestment, uh, building out state networks to fight for specific state legislative victories. But in various ways, everyone had reached this conclusion that nothing that we were doing felt powerful enough. Nothing we were working on was really grappling with the, the magnitude of the crisis um, or what was actually needed to face it down. So in a way, Sunrise came on a, re a recognition that we needed to build a mass movement and we needed to reckon with the past successes and also the failures of the climate movement up until that point. And um, that all came to fruition in the summer of 2017 when Sunrise launched just as a, a, a baby few small number of people and we've grown from a fledgling organization to one of the biggest players in the climate movement and um, on the left. And we're going to be digging in today to a few of our core strategies, organizing principles that we use to achieve our goals. And those goals include, first, um, making massive government action a common sense agenda. And that really means uh, acknowledging and leaning into the important role of government in fighting the climate crisis, understanding that the, the mass of the federal government is the only way that we will get uh, climate action that is big and bold and fast enough to address this crisis. And making it part of the common sense agenda um, means that it is understood by the general public that this is what is absolutely necessary that our leading politicians have no choice but to see this as the path forward. The second is to elect champions um, who are going to fight for climate action and vote out opponents. Sunrise has been very active for the last three years uh, on the electoral side of things going into the 2018 midterms and of course in this most recent 2020 um, election cycle. Really kind of took, took a big role in mobilizing the youth vote, making sure our generation showed up at the polls um, and really helped elect people who are going to fight for climate action up and down the ballot. And third, uh, to grow our movement by engaging in moral protest to hold whoever's in office accountable. And we're gonna talk a bit more in a moment by what we mean by the words moral protest. But to summarize, you know, Sunrise has seen <laughs> pretty incredible success in just a few short years of, ex of existence. And it's actually not by luck, by, um, but actually by a very well-crafted plan based on history and strategy, um, based on studying the theory uh, and practice of decades of community organizing and social movements that came before us, both in the, in the US and across the globe. And many of these lessons were passed on to Sunrise by the INE Institute, which developed the momentum training through which many Sunrise leaders um, were trained. And you can read more about the momentum community um, at the link that Muriel just dropped in the chat. It's uh, a fun little deep dive if you're if you want to nerd out about um, organizing uh, theory and strategy. But right now we're going to kind of give you a preview today. We're going to be looking at three core organizing principles from this kind of momentum body of work that Sunrise utilizes in, um, in all of our organizing. And the fun part is we're also going to discuss where we see them showing up in Torah and how they have been applied to our movement in recent years. And as organizers, as Jews, it's really fun to look at Torah stories from an organizing lens. And it is, it is, yeah, what a gift that we have this treasure trove of very old stories that contain so many examples of people building power and overcoming adversary and joining uh, together to move from, um, from, from the world as it is to the world as it could be and, and what we dream it could be. So these three organizing principles are polarization, escalation and decentralization. 
And again, we're going to dig into all three of these right now. And with that, I will pass it over to Muriel to take us into the first one, polarization. Thanks, Mo. Thanks for that lovely introduction. And I realized as you were talking, um, we might have actually skipped over mentioning our own links to why we're talking about this material today. So I'll just briefly say that Mo and I are both uh, leaders within Sunrise Bay Area, which is one of the larger hubs of the Sunrise Movement. And Mo was a founder of our hub and we've both served as hub coordinators um, for the Bay Area hub. So um, with that, into polarization, my favorite, because it actually raises a lot of eyebrows, I think, um, polarization is kind of a dirty word sometimes. Uh, especially today, it's often cited as a symptom or a cause of our toxic political environment. Uh, I know I was speaking to some folks at the Jewish Earth Alliance uh, a few months ago and got a, a fair amount of reasonable pushback from people who said, polarization, I spend my life working against this. Why would I try to cause it? And I just want to invite you to think about polarization a little bit differently today as actually one of our most powerful tools in our toolbox for bringing people into the movement. And it's a strategy that we use to force people to choose a side on a critical issue, in this case, climate justice, and then bring them over into active action to fight for climate justice on our side. So here's a tour story to illustrate. It's a midrash, I love midrash. These are stories we tell about our stories of Hannah and the Maccabees. So during the Greek occupation of Jerusalem in the second century BCE, a series of laws were passed stripping Jews of economic and religious rights and subjecting them to various persecutions to force Hellenistic assimilation. And one of these laws decreed that a Jewish bride would be given to a local military commander for the night, on the night of her wedding. Horrific. Uh, and then, uh, so on the night, uh, on the day of uh, Hannah's wedding, she, uh, Hannah was a daughter of the high priest, uh, Hana knew this was going to happen, that she was going to be given away on her wedding night to not her husband, to a Hellenistic commander. And so on the day of her wedding, she stood on her chair in the middle of the ceremony and ripped her clothes off. And the entire family covered their faces in embarrassment and shame. And Hana declared, are you more embarrassed of me standing here naked than the abuse I must face tonight by the hands of the Greek commander? Which side are you on? And Hana's brothers, led by Yehuda or Judah the Maccabee, as we know him, were agitated by Hannah's tohecha, by her rebuke, into action. And that night, they killed the local Greek commander, which sparked the Maccabean Re revolution, which restored Jewish sovereignty to Jerusalem. Now, Hannah dramatically forced her family to reckon with the oppression that she and the rest of her community were facing, the immorality of it, and shook them to once and for all stand up against it. And there's a lot more to say about the polarization that took place within the Jewish community at this time. And we're not going to get into it now, although it is fascinating and a complicated example that deserves probably more examination than we're gonna be able to give it. But we're gonna st stick to the more cut and dry read of this midrash for now. Um, Sunrise's assessment, our assessment of the general public is that there is a small but powerful slice of the population who are actively opposing action to achieve climate justice. Uh, this would be the, the fossil fuel executives uh, and the people supporting them. And then also a larger but still relatively small slice of the population that is actively part of the climate justice movement, that's us. And then a huge chunk of the population that are either passive supporters or really just don't think about it that much at all. And we believe that polarization is an essential strategy to move those passive supporters uh, or the neutral parts of the population um, over, wait, is it this way? Over, I'm trying to, to match the slide, um, into actively supporting our movements for climate justice. And we know that polarization will also drive some people to move into active opposition. That is the nature of this tactic. And that can be really hard to swallow, but it's okay. Uh, and sometimes even a good sign that we're winning, but only if it's super clear that many, many more people are being driven to join the ranks of our active supporters. So this is something we see in many movements uh, that have utilized this strategy before that, you know, as women's suffrage gained power, the slice of people who are against women's suffrage also increased 
but not by nearly as much as the percentage of people who became moved to push for women's suffrage. And the same can be said for civil rights as well. And we see this today uh, in the climate movement as we polarize people, that the vocal opposition has grown, but not nearly as fast or as mightily as we have. So some elements of strategic polarization is a simple message uh, where it's clear which side is the moral side. Um, so like when Hannah stood on the chair in this midrash and makes a very simple declaration and call, we also strive to do that in our messaging. So can just really quick in the chat, can you think of any contemporary movements, including ours, what those slogans might be? Like what, when you think of a phrase around what our movements stand for or what might be a polarizing phrase, maybe drop it in the chat, see if we can come up with one or two. Nothing about us without us. That is very pithy. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Black Lives Matter. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> um, yeah, Black Lives Matter is a great example of this uh, polarizing statement. You are you either believe Black Lives Matter or you're against us or you're against the Black Lives Matter movement. Act up, right, Max? Yeah. Never again means now. Thank you, Ray. Yeah, some that we use um, in addition to these examples are water is life. That's a very, that was used by uh, Standing Rock and water protectors uh, standing up against pipelines that would threaten their water supplies. Uh, another one that we use is good jobs and a livable future. Who would not be for good jobs and a livable future? And yeah, Candace, I see in the chat here, you said amazing that lives mattering is polarizing. And, and, and I think that actually really gets to the heart of it. That's what we're trying to do is demonstrate this is polarizing and you there is clearly a good side that you want to be on and really invite people in from neutrality from passive support to saying wow this is controversial i better stand up and affirm that this that we want good jobs and a, uh, and a livable future and that black lives do matter so yeah, i just want to just to yeah. add a, a little bit about that i think just emphasizing it a third time. I think that when Black Lives Matter is such a brilliant um, motto because exactly what you're saying, Muriel, you know, someone who maybe is a good white liberal who generally is, is um, for equality, um, who doesn't consider themselves racist or to hold any prejudice is suddenly seeing the country, you know, rocked by these protests and the call is Black Lives Matter. They might feel all sorts of ways about the broader movement. They might feel uncertain about <clears throat> the role of policing. They might not know very much information about the details of what this conflict is about. Mm -hmm. They might be um, hesitant to get, you know, to, to involve themselves more, but at the very basic level, they're being asked to choose. Do you think Black Lives Matter or do they not? And at that point, if you're that person, um, you're going to say, yes, I do think Black Lives Matter. And then that's going to call into question um, how you approach the whole issue, right? If I think Black Lives Matter, if that's something I believe, what therefore must I do? What does that say about me and my community and this broader movement? Um, just wanted to, to add that because I think it's one of the most clear and brilliant examples that, that we have. Thank you so much, Mo. Yeah, I really, I really appreciate that. Um, and I, I see that comment by Candace, the binary of this is awful. I, I hear that. And I think that's the same kind of pushback I was talking about where we're like, why do we have to be so binary? Why do we have to be so black and white? But part of this tactic is to say to people, this is a bit black and white. You either want a livable future or you don't. Which side are you on? Um, so that, Brings me to a very brief story about a time that we employed this principle in a tactic um, in ways that uh, our, we didn't take off our clothes, but we did stand on a chair, um, just like Hannah. So um, this was, I guess, the summer before last, time is made up now, but um, I think it was the summer before last, the, the Democratic Party had stated that climate was not gonna be one of its top issues or one of its top priorities as they went up against Trump and prepared to hopefully take office um, in 2021. 
And we were all, you know, climate activists across the country were wringing our hands. How could this not be a top issue? It's so deadly and urgent. And so we undertook a campaign with many different tactics and strategies to make sure that the Democratic Party understood that this was a top moral issue. And one of those strategies was to push the DNC, the governing behind the scenes governing body of the Democratic Party to talk more about climate in their debates, in their presidential primary debates, which they are in charge of. And so we launched a campaign to say, you should actually have a debate that's entirely framed around the, the climate crisis and um, talk about everything, but within the frame of the climate crisis. Um, and we organized, we started by calling the members of the DNC and we wrote letters and we petitioned and took meetings with them. And by the time they came to San Francisco for the summer meeting of the DNC to vote on this issue, um, we knew that this was a moment in which we were going to need to polarize around this issue. You are either for taking climate action and talking about the climate crisis or you're not. And so we organized um, more than a hundred allies to get up very early and go attend this DNC committee meeting where they would uh, vote on whether or not to have a climate focused debate. And we knew that they were probably not going to vote to hold the debate. We hoped, but we knew that the chances were slim. And so uh, we gathered our allies, we packed the house with people who were there to hear this one agenda item. When they got to the agenda item, they debated it for a very long time because we were there putting the pressure on them. And then eventually they voted it down. And so my co-organizer, Jackie Ellie Cordova and I uh, looked at each other and said, okay, this is it. And we um, had our Hana and the Maccabees moment where we stood up on our chairs in this very formal meeting and um, called out and said, um, we are afraid for our future. We are afraid for our lives. We're afraid of for an un uninhabitable planet. Please, please, please use the enormous microphone that you have to you know, talk about this issue. And then all of the folks we'd organized to be there also rose up, some stood on their chairs and we sang the famous union organizing song fam made famous by coal, written by coal um, strikers, uh, which side are you on? And really made that a clear moment. You are either for us or against it, uh, against us. And then we um, walked out of the room. Um, and the happy ending is that now, of course, climate is one of the top four issues um, in the Democratic Party agenda. But I think um, I think there's a link here that's probably really embarrassing that I <laughs> do a video or something that Mo's going to pull up. OK, I will do my best here. Um, let me know if, uh, let's see. Let me know if the sound doesn't come through in a moment. Yay! <laughs> so that was our action, um, and and it, and, it, and it achieved what we wanted it to achieve, even though we did not win our demand. And I think that's a really important distinction to understand. We did not get a climate debate. We lost that vote, but we used that moment to polarize around the fact that this was an issue that young people were going to were prepared to leave the party over if they did not start talking about it like our lives were at stake. And I think we've seen this dramatic and kind of amazing shift 
uh, by the centrists of the party, including Biden, who has come into office with pretty strong words to say about climate. So um, that's that's my story about polarization. I can see uh, that we're heating up in the chat a little bit uh, about whether or not um, whether or not polarization is a is a Jewish value, but I can assure you in my world it is. And we're gonna move on now to uh, another tactic that we use to polarize people and to bring people into the movement, which is escalation or escalated moral protest. Great, thank you so much, Muriel. Okay, so I do wanna keep us moving, but please keep the conversation going in the chat. That is a really, yeah, rich, um, rich conversation. I wanna talk next about principle two, which is escalation or um, another way of, that we sometimes say it, escalated moral protest. And actually the story that Muriel just told is also a great example of escalation. Um, so I wanna dig into it a little bit more here because it is one of the key parts of um, our movement and of all social movements in history. And we define moral protest as nonviolent action that brings the truth of the crisis into eyes of the public and asks the public to pick a side. So as you can see from that, um, from that definition, it's very interwoven with polarization. These two work hand in hand. And escalation um, or escalated moral protest allows us to move passive supporters and neutrals into active supporters. Um, so I guess another way of saying it is that escalated moral protest is the um, mechanism by which polarization often takes place. Not always, but often. Um, and so some of these elements might be um, that, that make moral protest effective is that the audience is actually the public. Really key, so I'm gonna say it again audience is the public. And this is one of the classic mistakes that a lot of people, um, a lot of organizers make. When we talk about who, who our target or who our audience is, um, in the story, I'll use the story that Muriel just told. The target, one could say, was the DNC. And in a way, they absolutely were. We very much wanted the DNC to change their minds and vote to have there be a climate debate. But there was another audience which was the public, the general public, everyday people um, who were watching this. And they were actually uh, almost more important. We knew that, um, you know, we could end up in this place right now in 2020 without, or 2021, excuse me, without ever having gotten a climate debate. But if we were successful in mobilizing the public, we could elect a democratic president, uh, win back, uh, the Senate and be in a place to uh, be able to pass ambitious climate legislation if the broader public were for us. Um, and that means, of course, that the public must be able to see it and hear about it. The public must be able to understand the words you're using. So if we were talking to the DNC using insider lingo about committees and uh, process and whatnot, that would be useless because it wouldn't be that meaningful to the general public. One way that we do that is that we connect it to commonly held values, um, talk about what matters to people, and that is part of what makes people choose a side. And um, a lot of these tactics often include um, or, or, you know, increase in participation, so more people doing it, an increase in sacrifice or um, risk or what it takes for a person to participate, and disruption. Um, and we know, of course, you know, the whole reason that we're doing this is that to win on climate at the scale and scope that is needed, we need um, a massive movement. We need an active base of public support. And the way that we build our base is by talking to people in our communities, by reaching out to our friends and network. Um, through those one-on-one -on -one conversations, through those community forums. But of course, we can't reach the, you know, the mass numbers of people just through those one-on-one -on -one conversations. So the way that we do that is we um, take escalated action, engage in moral protests to reach the masses. And today, uh, with this reality of social media, of the internet, uh, news media, we can do things that reach millions of people 
people online in a way that we would never be able to do if we were talking just to our neighbors and friends um, one on one. And the story that I want to tell, the, the Torah story that I want to tell that connects to this, many of you might have guessed it, it's a pretty obvious choice, is the story of Moses and the plague. Um, so as you know, uh, the story of Moses bringing plagues into Egypt is often um, very clearly as escalating tactics to convince Pharaoh to change his mind and allow the people of Israel to But in reality, the plagues never succeeded um, in changing Pharaoh's mind. In fact, Pharaoh's heart is burdened with each from Moses. And we see even after the plague of death of the firstborn, when Pharaoh momentarily concedes, he then almost, almost immediately uh, changes his mind <clears throat> again and is, is pursuing the fleeing Israelites. So I think that's another example of rather than reading the plagues as a series of escalating tactics, only with the goal of convincing Pharaoh, we can also interpret this part of the story as a series of escalating tactics to polarize uh, the people of Israel and get them ready to choose a side and to be ready to rise up against their oppressors and take that, that step of being willing to rise up and to flee. So on our end, um, by taking escalated action, we bring the, the really the moral crisis of climate change to the public and we take the pain and the suffering that is happening right now in communities all over the country, all over the world, um, and we make it visible to everyone. And by doing that, we bring more people into our movement. We make that collective experience known and we tell people um, it doesn't have to be this way. There is something we can do about this and we want you to be a part of it. We can shift passive supporters, people who might be concerned about the issue but don't know how to take action or aren't sure it's for them into active supporters who are taking steps in their life to fight climate change. And we put the climate crisis in the, in the media spotlight. So um, with that, I want to jump back to how this looks in Sunrise and what it's been like in my experience. Um, and I wanna tell a story from the, let's see, late 2018, early 2019. This was right after the 2018 midterms um, when, you know, uh, we took back the house. It was this wave, I'm sure we all remember, of hope after a first really dark two years of the Trump administration. And Sunrise Movement, at that point still a pretty small, scrappy young movement, um, had gone all out fighting to elect um, elect champions, elect progressive champions to help take back the house. We had mobilized our generation. We had worked so hard to make sure um, that the Democrats could get back the house. And then just, what was it, a day or two after this victory, instead of, um, instead of celebrate, we did celebrate, but instead of resting on our laurels, instead of saying, you know, thank you so much, everyone, um, Nancy Pelosi, like, please, you know, we just work so hard to help elect all these people. Now, please, you know, pay us back and help make climate an issue. What they did instead is had about 100 young people sit in uh, in Nancy Pelosi's office to demand that she and the new Democratic House leadership back a Green New Deal. And this was a bold and risky move. Um, and it's not something that uh, that a lot of a lot of people would have done, but it was brilliant and it worked and it reached it reached millions of people around the country. That was the moment when Representative Alexandria Ocasio Cortez joined the um, young uh, protesters and said, "Yes, I'm with you. I agree with you." Um, this is going, I'm going to make sure this is a priority of the new Democratic Congress. And um, from that moment on, we started escalating. So went out with a bang and did a ton of other tactics, emailing, calling, posting on social media, 
um, people lobbying their representatives, asking them to, to stand up and support um, the Green New Deal. And then in early 2019, um, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Senator Ed Markey introduced a resolution for the Green New Deal formally in Congress, and we continued. Um, there, were, there were many more protests and sit-ins and occupations um, to, 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 yes, Candace, to make it urgent. And I think with an issue like climate, where we know it's this looming thing coming down on us, but um, for a lot of folks, especially white and privileged and upper middle class or middle class people, people in the northern um, hemisphere, we, we aren't feeling as many of the impacts, at least on a day to day basis. And with so many other urgent crises, it's understandable that climate isn't always at the top of the list. Um, so we have to make it so and we have to show people why it's absolutely essential that we act now and that it is deeply connected to so many of our other urgent priorities. And as we continue this, this escalating um, arc, these, this escalated moral protest, more and more young people all over the country um, were sitting in. Many were getting arrested. Hundreds were getting arrested in three different sit-ins at major democratic offices. And it told a powerful story, you know, by willing to risk arrest, these young people showed that they have the, the courage to fight for their homes and their futures and their families. Um, and it also pointed out that the democratic leadership was lacking some of that courage and the public, the public noticed. Um, I want to tell- in. I'll just yeah. in here and say really quickly, I wasn't at this action, but it actually was the action that polarized me into the movement and um, mm -hmm. moved me to join Sunrise. So we had around the time this action happened, terrible fires in the Bay Area and I was just like many of us crawling out of my skin. Like, what am I going to do? This is, we're, this, we're really deep in this crisis. And um, then, you know, saw them sitting in on social media and in the news and realized that these, this was like where I could give my energy. So um, just from that side of it, it was very effective for me. <laughs> Sorry, Mo, back and, to you. <laughs> no, thank you, Muriel. And um I can't tell you how many people have told me that, how many uh, top leaders in our movement like Muriel now have told me that this action that they saw on social media with AOC was the thing that mobilized them into action. They had been feeling this terror, this grief, this anxiety about climate, feeling like they weren't doing enough, but they didn't know what to do. And it was this moment that showed them that there could be another way and welcomed them into the movement. Um, so here in the Bay Area, um, we were tasked with getting our own representatives to sign on to the Green New Deal. And uh, this is one where uh, we were, again, successful in reaching millions and millions of people through news outlets and social media, brought in thousands of new people into our movement and launched, I think, a few hundred new local chapters of the Sunrise Movement. And these were people who, again, had, you know, were previously passive supporters, but they were activated. And this is the moment of uh, when Senator Dianne Feinstein had that viral moment of talking down to um, a bunch of kids and young organizers who had asked her to um, sign on in support of the Green New Deal. And I'm going to share this video. Uh, let's see, not that one. I'm here to fight for my home. I'm going to skip over a few. Okay. Um, some of you might have seen this already. I'll show it again, just as a fun refresher for us. trying to ask you to vote yes on the Green New Deal. Oh, please. Okay, I'll tell you what. We have our own Green New Deal. Some scientists have said that we have 12 years to turn this around. Well, it's not going to get turned around in 10 years. What we can do Senator, if is this doesn't put get turned around in 10 years, you're looking at the faces of the people who are going to be yeah. living with yeah. these Guess consequences. What? The government and is supposed to be for the people and by the people and you know what's interesting about this group 
is I've been doing this for 30 years. I know what I'm doing. You come in here and you say it has to be my way or the highway. I don't respond to that. I've gotten elected. I just ran. I was elected by almost a million vote plurality. And I know what I'm doing. So, you know, maybe people should listen a little bit. I hear what you're saying, but we're the people who voted you. You're supposed to listen to us. That's your job. How old are you? I'm 16. I can't vote. Well, you didn't vote for me. I'm 24. It doesn't matter. We're the ones who should be impacted. It doesn't matter. We're going to be the ones who are impacted. Yeah, but you were the ones who voted. I understand that. I understand that. I have seven grandchildren. Yeah, but you're the ones who voted for you or not. I understand that. I have seven grandchildren. I understand it very well. Senator, the cost of not taking this action is far higher than the cost of what the Green New Deal will be. And there Here's is enormous popularity for this bill around okay. the whole country. Here's and we're asking you to be brave proposing. and do this for us and, and for your grandchildren. Get enough for I'm trying to do the best I can, which was to write a responsible resolution. Any plan that, that doesn't take bold, transformative okay. Okay. action is not going to be what we need. We well, need your you know better than I do. So I think one day you should run for the Senate. Great. And then you do it your way. But by that time, in the meantime, by that time, there's going to be a big problem. I just won a big election. Would um, anyone like to share, um, uh, like, uh, your reactions in the chat? Just type if you had a a reaction. I know I always need a moment after I watch that video. (laughs) Did she change? Did she change her mind? No. No. She kept on with the same patter. Yeah. yeah. She sure did. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm past her age and I'm, I'm working with a group that's trying to pull in seniors like me to be a part of this. And this is really good. What you've been telling us. Oh, it's that's very, great. It's very different from what I've been hearing. The, um, I won't go into details because I don't want to, you know, interrupt the meeting. Go ahead. Thank, Thank you so you much, so Susan. Much, Susan. <laughs> that's that's in, that's inspiring to hear. Thank you for doing that work. It's so important. Um, great. So, yes, this moment. Whew, that was that was quite a time. Um, and I can tell you, we had no idea <clears throat> that was going to happen when we went out there that day. Um, in fact, we, we didn't even think we were going to be able to meet with her. We had not been told we were going to get a meeting. Um, it, it was uh, one of the most wild moments of my life so far. Um, and, you know, I, I think this is a really good illustration of escalated moral protest because, um, you know, when we were in Pelosi's or Feinstein offices, yes, we were asking them. Um, you know, we showed up with a couple hundred people. She invited, you know, maybe 15 of us inside unexpectedly. We were asking them, please um, sign on to endorse the Green New Deal. But it was only powerful. That moment in that office was only so powerful because we recorded it, because uh, we could post it online and a few hundred thousand and then a few million and then over, you know, 10 or 15 million um, people ultimately saw it because it struck a chord with the general public. Um, And, you know, we were telling her if she truly cared about our generation, uh, if she was truly committed to climate action, she would find a way to support the only plan on the table um, that was going to address the climate crisis at the the scale and scope that climate, that the justice and science really demanded. And, You know, Sunrise has organized hundreds of escalated moral protests all across the country over the last few years. And that's been one of the key ways that we have built our base through moments like these that capture the public's imagination that really point to the deep divide um, and the need for our elected officials to to be brave and kind of take the action that they say they can't do, they don't wanna do, that's hard. We know it's hard and we're asking them to do it. and yes, we were, we were joined that day by um, really incredible youth activists from Youth vs. Apocalypse, um, Earth Guardians and others. 
And um, yeah, these, these, while we were doing this, there were dozens or maybe even hundreds of other Sunrisers who were holding similar um, protests at their representative's office around the country. Obviously not all of them went viral, um, but there were, there were so many happening at the same time. And the way that we have been able to do this um, to carry out all these actions and to absorb all the people that were mobilized by these moments was through a third principle um, <clears throat> called decentralization. And this is a really other key one. And I, I see we're running a little short on time, but I'm going to pass it to Muriel now to see if she can squeeze it in because it's a really key one. Thank you, Mo. Uh, I think I can squeeze it in. So a core principle of our movements is that we need to grow the movement to a massive scale so that we can use people power to win our demands. And we actually have to move, grow much faster than is kind of even imaginable for an organization or for a movement beyond just one organization. So decentralization is a key part of how we um, structure ourselves uh, in order to be able to grow this fast. Uh, decentralization means many people taking on many tasks and roles, working with autonomy and unity. So here's a Torah story for you. After escaping Egypt, Moses begins to act as the sole leader for the community. And while Moses is amazing, wise, brave, and powerful with unparalleled connections to the divine, he uh, cannot counsel the community all alone. It's too much. Yitro, who is Moses's father-in-law, witnesses how exhausting and inefficient this task is for Moses and how the community is not being served by the centralized leadership. So Yitro instructs Moses to empower other people in the community to be leaders alongside him. And with this new shared leadership structure in place, the people of Israel were able to survive their decades in the wilderness. So I love this story because it just shows that scale requires decentralization. And we believe that in order to win, we need to have a movement with many leaders. And this for me means that we can't rely solely on a small number of people in our hub or in our movement to guide us in our work. And instead, we wanna support people taking uh, initiative in line with Sunrise principles to build our power for a Green New Deal, guided by the same principles, but not under one centralized leadership structure. So our structure is a loose snowflake model where interconnected teams work together to reach shared goals. Uh, and these teams do the bulk of the work for the movement, doing everything from planning actions to managing hub finances and building community. Um, and I'll let Mo say a little bit more about that structure and how we've built it. Yeah, so this has been really key and to be quite honest, really hard. Um, it involves letting go of a lot of power and control. Um, and as a, um, yeah, that's personally, uh, that's been hard for me. I think it's hard for a lot of people on an institutional level. It requires in a way opening up yourself to more risk when you say this movement belongs to everyone any three people are empowered to go out into the world and take action in the name of Sunrise. We have other principles like nonviolence and others that kind of offer guidelines within people, within which people have to act if they want to be considered part of our movement. Um, but it means that people can be doing all sorts of things, strategic and unstrategic, um, and we're giving them the full power to do that. It is also the only way we are ever going to grow big enough and um, give people that power and autonomy to, to take things on and, and build it themselves. Um, so like Muriel said, you know, in our local chapter, we have hub coordinators who kind of guide the overall hub, um, but really are there to support the teams. Teams are empowered to take on their own work, um, move their own projects. And of course we have local hubs who are autonomous, who can choose to do whatever they want they are given guidance and support and resources. They are started, um, you know, people start hubs because they agree with the Sunrise vision and strategy. But from that point on, they're free to do what they will. And that has meant that we have hundreds and hundreds of hubs. Um, we've taken, you know, thousands and thousands of actions. Again, some strategic, some unstrategic, but that's the only way that we have been able to grow and, and kind of get to that, um, that level. So. Yeah, this is so, this is so hard. <laughs> and I think it's 
notable that, you know, like w these are snowflakes within snowflakes um, where, uh, you know, the, the national movement is set up to be decentralized where instead of centralized leadership, they say, okay, we're gonna have hubs all over the country that are doing, you know, their own thing guided by our principles. And then within our own hub, our hub is so big, we were like, oh my gosh, we actually need a decentralized snowflake structure within our hub as well. Um, so we have all sorts of teams all over the Bay Area working on different things together. And, you know, it's kind of all we can do to keep track of it all sometimes. Um, and that means sometimes you see an action happen and you're like, oh, I would not have done it that way. You know, um, oh, is that strategic? That is, this is not when I would have done it or is that, that's not how I would have messaged it. But it's not really your place to say, don't do that. Um, and it's it's kind of like you have to learn to embrace the um, the chaos a little bit and know that that's kind of a, a sign of success that there are so many actions happening that you can't even keep track of them all. Yeah, absolutely. It means training is really important. It means alignment's important, and it means you struggle together and you work through it. Um, thanks for adding that, Muriel. Yeah. So let's see here. I am going to stop sharing my screen. We have two minutes left and we had been hoping to have time for breakouts, um, but we obviously don't. And just the last two minutes, I'd like to invite people to just share in the chat uh, the questions that we were going to have um, in breakouts. And the first is, uh, uh, what is one insight that you are taking away? And the second is, maybe a question that you are still sitting with. I'll put those in the chat. You can think about it for a moment. But we would love to hear an insight and a question. And we know that a lot of the things that we've shared here today are um, unusual and they might go against some of the organizing principles or, or the common sense of how we think about the world. Um, and really wanna thank you for uh, for being here and it was such a joy to share this space with you all and for being willing to be open to some of these ideas um, and we'd love to talk more about them. Um, uh, you can definitely feel free to reach out to us and actually Muriel I'm wondering if you can share if people want to get involved um, how they can do that. Yeah so um, I, I, I really hope you'll all um, consider joining a local organization to organize to help grow this movement if you're not already. Um, we are both volunteers with Sunrise Bay Area. Um, there are Sunrise Hubs all over the country if you're um, 35 or younger. Um, I really encourage you to check out your local hub or if there isn't a hub near you, start one. Um, there was some conversation in the chat about how folks over 35 have uh, supported uh, our local Bay Area hub, we have a 35 plus uh, team, which is just a, an amazing team that uh, definitely has given so much to our movement. And, um, you know, all ages are welcome to support and, and help grow the Sunrise movement. And then um, another great way to get involved is um, with Dianu, which is another organization that I'm working with right now. And we are a Jewish call to climate action using some of the same principles of mass movement building and organizing and decentralization. And um, we call our decentralized um, pods uh, Dainu Circles. And if you would like to start a Dainu Circle or find out if there's one near you, you are very welcome to do that. Um, I see Laura's question, are there Bay Area Dainu Circles? Uh, Laura, I believe there's already uh, a couple happening. And um, if you'd like to uh, learn more about that, you can check out um, our website, which is dainu.org. Um, and uh, there's ways to get in touch there with, um, with folks who can help you set up a Dianu circle. Do the proper link here. Um, and there's a little form on the site you can fill out and our, one of our organizers will be in touch with you to help you start a circle. Um, and you know, I'll just say, I've been at this festival for five days um, and it's been really um, amazing. I think we're at a really critical moment in the Jewish community of, of Jewish climate organizing really taking off. There have been Jews organizing for climate all along. Um, our hub is a, has a lot of Jewish members in it, but we were not doing it in a Jewish context. And just watching what Dayenu is up to and what um, everyone at this festival has been up to over the past five days, I think we're at a moment of, of, um, of takeoff. 
And it would be such a blessing if all of you were, um, were part of that. So I really hope you'll, you'll reach out and um, get involved.